All right, let's kick this off. Uh, welcome to our live website, Teardown. We're excited to have you join us today. I'm Juliana Casale. I'm the head of marketing at Crazy Egg. And today we're going to be analyzing the e-commerce website of our willing victim, activewear brand, TommyCopper.com, with the help of our friends at Sierra Agency, The Good. So I'm going to hand the reins over to our hosts so they can introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is JL and I'm part of the customer success team here at Crazy Egg. Uh, Crazy Egg gives you the competitive advantage to improve the website in a heartbeat without the high cost. So we do that through snapshots, recordings, A-B testing, and an editor feature, which you'll learn more about while we do this teardown. John? Hey there, I'm John McDonald. I am CEO and founder of The Good. The Good is a conversion rate optimization firm, and we've been helping brands to convert more of their existing website traffic into customers for about 10 years now. Thanks guys. Now we're gonna walk through today's agenda, which is a brief overview of conversion rate optimization, so everyone's on the same page. Then what you're all here for, a live analysis of TommyCopper.com. And lastly, a Q&A. We want to save plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation, but don't let that stop you from sharing any questions you have along the way in the chat as we go along. So if you anything pops up that you want to have us tackle, just pop it in the chat box and we'll get to it at the end. So now John is going to kick things off with what is CRO? Thanks. So this is how we define conversion rate optimization here at The Good. A data-backed system for increasing the percentage of website visitors that convert into customers or more generally take any desired action on a web page. Now, I know that's a mouthful, so let's break this down pretty quickly here. Starting with data-backed. So conversion rate optimization is not about trying random tactics until one works. It is really about using data about tracking every click and movement of your site's visitors to decide where it is best to optimize. This means not blindly copying your competition or just following best practices that you read about on the internet. Really, it's about making data-backed decisions based on your specific site visitors' actions. So a system is really, you know, any seasoned conversion strategist knows that successful optimization is found not just in one tactic, but really in the compounding effect of continued optimization, really applied in a structured and well-planned manner over some time. And then taking any desired action on a web page, it's important to point out here that a purchase is not the only conversion point that matters. On the contrary, helping your visitors go further down the funnel and into your purchase funnel can really be just as valuable. So you can focus on other key metrics like email signups, and we'll talk a lot about that today, or path to purchase and how your navigation flows, to looking and reading at product reviews, for instance, if you find that that is what helps people be more comfortable converting. Really, anything that your data shows influences a purchase is, is just as important as the ultimate conversion of uh, that purchase. So we call these micro conversions and they are breadcrumbs for how to increase online sales. JL, do you want to talk a little bit about tools of the trade here? Yeah, thank you, John. So these are all tools that are showing on the page now um, that small business owners, e-commerce brands, education companies, um, and agencies alike can use from small to medium to large to enterprise. The good, as John was saying, commonly uses these tools to analyze and optimize visitors, uh, sorry, websites of their customers. And lots of customers come in and use our tools if they have a marketing department or if they don't, they're doing it uh, in-house. So later in the session, I'll be showing you various visitor reports. Um, and if you want to learn more about user testing and A-B testing, we have a number of other upcoming webinars on these topics that will be made available to you at the end of the presentation. All right, so we're going to get into the good stuff here. Uh, John's going to run us through a heat map analysis of TommyCopper.com. I really want to thank Crazy Egg customer David Link for volunteering their website for the teardown. Uh, we promise to be gentle. 
So David, if you or your team are in attendance today, it looks like you are in the chat. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I'm going to hand things over to John. Great, thank you. So JL, do you mind pulling up that heat map for me? Here we go. Okay, this is great. We can start here first. So really, this is Tommy Copper's homepage. And using a critical eye, let's take a moment and review it briefly for ourselves. Uh, what, what do you notice? Where is your eye drawn to? Take a second and feel free to show your answers in the chat box if you'd prefer. I, uh, I'll, I'll look at those as well. We can repeat a few out if, if you notice anything important here. Okay, the coupon, that's true. Yep, I is drawn right there. All right, JL, oh, the red sale logo. That's a great one too, that tout. We'll talk about that and the main banner image, perfect. Yeah, so you can see there's a lot to look at here right off the bat. So let's look at this heat map. Thank you, JL, for pulling that up. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to look at one data point to use as a basis for this assessment. Uh, at least my portion, JL, will show you some other capabilities of Crazy Egg here in a moment. But what we're going to look at for the teardown, and my portion of that, is a heat map here. So I'm going to start at the top of the page we we're going to review today, which is the home page here for Tommy Copper, and work our way all the way down to the bottom. Also, I want to be clear that these are all recommendations for things that we would suggest running A-B testing with on the site. And uh, so think of these as suggestions for A-B tests that should be run on the site as opposed to changes that should just be made wholesale. Now, if you're not familiar with heat mapping, all you really need to know is that it goes from hot to cold. That's why it's called a heat map. So red is where the most interaction is happening on the page. And then it cools off from there. So it goes from red to yellow to green to blue. In a lack of color, that is where nobody interacted at all. So you can see throughout the page here, there's a bunch of hot spots that we're gonna look at today. So let's take a quick look at this heat map and dive in. Uh, now you all already have seen some of this page, but without me calling anything out right away, what do you see here? Uh, I see an immediate concern. Can someone perhaps suggest what that might be? Feel free to type it in the chat box. Clicking off the coupon, that's a great example. So the first thing I wanna talk about here is this email pop-up. So I'm, you know, I'm on a crusade to rid the internet of email pop-ups. You know, I hear it all the time, but John, they work. And, and really my thought process is, but do they? What is the quality of the emails that you're getting from these pop-ups? Do the users just unsubscribe after they get their discount code? Or even worse, do they just not open your emails or start marking them as spam after they've gotten that discount code, which is really just gonna drive down your deliverability. Now, this doesn't mean that emails are uh, invaluable. Uh, quite the opposite, it's one of the highest converting channels that we see. But really, my point here is that you should keep in mind that once you offer a discount to a new customer, you're forever seen as a discount brand to that consumer. And it's a really hard barrier to overcome in the future. So email pop-ups or overlays are also a huge barrier to user flow. So now, I like to think is of e-com sites as a retail store. Imagine walking into your retail store, a salesperson jumps out in front of you with a clipboard demanding your email before you can move any further. That's just not cool, right? You'd likely turn around and leave. Or at the very worst, you'd be very frustrated and tell that employee off. You're presenting the exact same experience for consumers here. Now, we've been helping brands convert higher on their sites for about 10 years now. And we've really only seen two reasons that consumers are at your site. One is to conduct research and understand if your product or service is going to solve their pain or their need. And the second is to convert. They want to complete a purchase as quickly and easily as possible if you can indeed solve that need. So interactions like email pop-ups that disrupt these two goals are really only going to serve to turn people away. Now, let's take a look at some specifics of this pop-up here. We're gonna take a look here. In regards to this specific pop-up, visitors are looking for two things. They're looking for reassurance and understanding of how you're gonna use their information. So visitors here are gonna be looking for things like privacy information. 
If I give you my email, how are you going to use it? And you can see that's missing here entirely. What it says here is just stay in the loop and receive a special discount. Well, I don't understand. I know I'm going to get that discount email, but what are you going to do with my email address after that? You really need to reassure and reiterate uh, a few items to increase conversions. So understanding first how you're going to use the information by stating a clear privacy statement near the signup field, ideally. And second, how often will you use that information? How many emails are they committing to receiving? Can they unsubscribe with one click at any time? And third, can they sign up later, perhaps as part of the checkout process if they don't want to do it now? You know, reassuring that visitor that the opportunity to receive this discount isn't gone if they choose to close that pop-up right now. But really, back to my main point on pop-ups, try not to do a pop-up at all and instead baking these email collection forms into the page content where the users aren't disrupted from accomplishing their two goals is really what's going to be important here. Now let's go back up to the top of the page and work our way down all the way to the footer. First thing I want to call out here, maybe a little bit hard to see, but it says free shipping on orders with two or plus items. I would first say that we should uh, eliminate the pop-up from the heat map overlay, or at least get both views because we're likely missing some key information from this heat map here. But uh, these top promotion bars have really become commonplace lately. They do work. In fact, Free shipping is the best performer in these bars. We've seen it time and again. And only free shipping, meaning when it's combined with another offer, like free shipping and a percentage off, the effectiveness seems to go down dramatically. So sticking to one main offer here in these promo bars, based on our testing and experience, like free shipping and uh, works extremely well. And in fact, free shipping is the best performer. It's a clear winner on that messaging. We can dive into the navigation next. First of all, I think the navigation here is done really, really well. So uh, well done on that, David. Uh, you can see plenty of interaction here, which is a great sign. Overall, it's compact and it's helpful to the consumer. Now we've also found that a main site navigation should have no more than five main items to it. And you can see here that there are four, men, women, outlet, and bundles. So that's great. I also love that search is front and center here. Visitors who use search will convert the highest of anybody on your site. They know what they want and they're looking to go directly to that product by searching for it. So keep in mind how important it is to optimize your site and your search result pages. I would really suggest tracking all of your search inquiries and then starting to optimize for the top 10 right away. Search for them yourself, see what the results are, and make sure you've got a clear conversion funnel for those results. Because these are often some of the most forgotten pages from, that we see from brands that engage the good. But you know, the good news is, is that means they're likely one of the biggest opportunities on your site for you to get a very quick win and increase the conversions right away. Now, before we scroll down the page a little bit, I want to point out here the uh, area behind the pop-up. It might be a little hard to see, but there's an auto-rotating image carousel here. Now, these are extremely popular with marketers because they always want to communicate a lot of information in a small space, which I'm sympathetic to. I totally understand that. Now, it's a bit hard to see here, but I can tell you that they just flat out kill conversions. There's a few reasons for this. The first is that they're a distraction because these auto-rotating banners move at a seemingly random interval to the visitor as they're looking at other content on the page. So as they start scrolling down, they see something rotate you know, up, uh, up above a little bit, or as they're looking at the navigation, there's an animation below. It's very distracting. Second is, is that they're frustrating because as the user is really trying to read or look at the image, it will often rotate automatically to the next one before they're ready. And that can be extremely frustrating if that's ever happened to you, likely has, you, you understand that. Third, clicking on the calls to action within the image can be equally frustrating. You go to click and it rotates, or uh, the, the call to action moves around within that image sometimes um, as it rotates. 
And four, the data just clearly shows that these are ineffective. So one research report by the University of Notre Dame recently came out and said that 1% of users clicked on the feature. Of that, 89% clicked in the first position, and then only 1% of clicks for the most significant object on the page was the result. So if you think about this, 1% of people are clicking the biggest area on the page. That's, that's a really low number. And that also means that only 89% of that 1% are even engaging beyond that first image. So that means that anything past that first image is really unlikely to get seen at all. And it's certainly not going to get interacted with. And our data across optimizing hundreds of sites replicates this exact finding. Moving down just a little bit here, uh, I love this guarantee and the placement of it. If you can't read it, it says 60 day money back guarantee. And then it has a little button. There's a little blue area to the right down there. It says details. Now, guarantees are a great way to increase trust with consumers. And doing so right up front is setting a great tone for the consumer as they visit the rest of the page and, and the rest of the site. They're going to be put at ease right away. So that, that's wonderful. Well done there. However, it looks like a decent amount of visitors are clicking to the right where it says details, that little blue arrow there, uh, little blue area, excuse me there. I know it can be hard to read, but I, I promise it's there. And I would really suggest testing a couple of variants here. I would remove just the link and include the info in the footer of the site. So perhaps not sending people who are brand new to your site to click on that and get out of the purchase flow. Or the other option is, is to go all in on it and make the detail link a proper call to action to match all of the other call to actions on the site, which we'll take a look at here in a moment. All right, you mind uh, scrolling down a little bit for me, JL, please? Thank you. So one thing that I wanted to, uh, to show here is that tout. Someone had actually called this out earlier as something that stuck out off the page. And touts like these, the one here that says up to 40% off, tend to perform extremely well. You can see how it is influencing clicks on the shop now, right here. Uh, and for that specific tile, it's performing much better than, than all of the other clicks and the other tiles. Especially when compared to the one above, if you look at this tile here, it says save 40% now on compression tops. But you can see there's a lot less interaction right below that box here. Um, so it's one thing to consider. These do perform extremely well. Joe, could you uh, scroll down a little bit here to the, to the best selling items, please? Perfect. So as we get down the page a little more here, one thing that I wanted to call out is we can see clearly how the interaction level has dropped dramatically here, right? There's a lot less going on in the heat map here. This is very likely because each product is missing a very clear call to action like the tiles above have. So I would strongly suggest testing the addition of low intent call to action buttons here. By low intent, I mean, for example, view more, learn more, view details, but certainly not something like buy now which is likely going to prevent clicks because people aren't ready to just actually buy at this step. They're looking to get more information. One thing we could do is you could likely even remove the star ratings from here as well. While social proof is something that you really want, uh, the reason is that we've already stated these are best sellers. So you already have that social proof and you don't really need more of it at this stage of the funnel. It will be great to have on that product detail page, however. Can we scroll just a little bit more there for me, Gio? Perfect. Now let's talk about this email signup form here, which is really actually great placement right above the footer. But we're also missing all of those other, other items that I mentioned as part of the email pop-up earlier. Adding in that reassurance copy near this form, making sure that people understand how you're going to use their information and what they should be receiving is all extremely important. We do find that these perform quite well. So having that additional information should make them perform even better. All right, we're almost there, David. We're at the footer. So let's take a look at that next. A couple of things that are a challenge here. The first is the uh, contact information is missing from the bottom right-hand corner of the footer. 
In our testing, we see that nothing increases trust more than having contact information clearly showing in the footer. And in the first place consumers look for it is that bottom right-hand corner of the site. If they want to get a hold of you, they're going to scroll all the way down and look in that bottom right-hand corner. Now, yes, there is a contact link here in the footer. In fact, you can see how much interaction it's getting, which really just emphasizes this point even more. So it's really something to be thinking about. Next, one thing I'm concerned about here is that there's only one option for the consumer to continue down the shopping path if they reach the footer. Now, if somebody is gonna scroll all the way down and read the entire homepage of your site, they're really interested in what you have to say and your products. So we really wanna make it easy for them to continue down that funnel. So you know, ideally, you would repeat the main navigation here in the footer as a new column. Now, you only have four items in your navigation, so that won't overclutter the footer, but it, one thing I should really call out here is that you see the outlet link is getting some clicks and that's great, but you know, having that clearly called out instead of hidden at the bottom of a list of links like outlet is here, is gonna be really important to help people move further down the funnel. So JL, do you wanna uh, share some additional insights from other types of reports you can see here? Dale, I don't think we can hear you if you have your mic on. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thanks for pointing that out, you guys. So um, what I was saying is everything you can see on the heat map, you see the brightest colors, but you don't have a, a sense either than the brighter the color, how many clicks are happening there. And it's the overlay report that's going to get you down to the details. Um, for more information on the overlay report, we have a great video and tutorial in our help center, but I'm just going to point out I'm on the both for the overlay, so I'm showing live clicks for links that take you somewhere, but also other which shows you dead clicks. And what I want to point out is the X here. So on the live click for people truly clicking where it's meant to close, there's been three clicks. Um, and then we have another click here of like the 1981 clicks that are happening. So there's an opportunity here to make the opportunity to close this pop out much easier for your visitors. They're just clicking off to the other side. But more to the point of what John was saying about the pop up, more than half of your uh, visitors that are actually signing up are closing out of this pop-up because they want to get straight into more details about the product. So it's just something to point out in that regards. The other aspect is um, a best practice for creating snapshots would be to omit pop-ups so that they're not blocking the visual um, report, the rest of your page, to see the details that's happening in behind. And any clicks that are happening on this pop-up, or even if I switch over to talk about the carousel here, any of the clicks that are happening that's not visibly seen on the report is going to show up under our list report and specifically the not visible tab. So again, we have a great tutorial um, on information on how to use the list report, or by all means, feel free to email us and we'll help you on that regards. But between those two reports, you'll gain a lot more information as to what is happening with people um, on your site. And in particular, you can get into the segments of those people if you're doing any campaigns and such. I'm going to switch over to the mobile to describe the scroll map report here. Um, so when I was looking through the reports. Um, one thing, David, I'd point out to your team is particularly on your mobile, in the scroll map report, similar to the heat map, the brighter the colors, 
the more engagement there is with that area. But if I zoom out here to show the entire page, your engagement for your mobile users uh, drops off significantly because your page is longer. So I'd give some consideration into revamping your experience for your mobile users. Um, I would check your Google Analytics to see how many uh, mobile visitors are purchasing on your site and see if you can improve the purchasing by uh, redesigning. And you can do this within our A-B testing um, tool. It will let you hide elements so you can play with that without actually redesigning the whole page uh, right off the bat. So those are, like I didn't go over the confetti report. Um, the confetti report will give you more of your segments. But in the interest of time, I wanted to jump to the recording. So everything that John has said and observed um, in regards to the heat map, stuff we've pointed out in some of these other reports, went through the recordings. And the recordings are going to give you an opportunity to really validate everything that you're observing in your snapshot reports. And it's, uh, I, I marked as favorite a few recordings here. And I'm going to just show you two recordings. So I'm going to pause it right here. And if you see along the progress bar here, there's no more red marks. There's no more interactions by the customer. Show, also shown in the timeline. The pop-up has come and people have abandoned the page. So if you view a few more recordings, you will actually see um, that type of behavior happening or people trying to, and actually that was a little fast, I apologize, but I'll just step it back here. Again, the pop-up occurs three seconds within them coming to your site on a mobile and they are closing it as quick as you, um, as quick as they can. And in the confetti report, you'll see that they're actually closing that pop-up between four to five seconds of uh, it coming up and them finding the X mark. So there's a little bit of frustration uh, occurring there on behalf of the visitor. This last recording. Again, it's just another a slightly different example, nothing to do with the pop-up experience, but again, making that time to view your recordings, especially when you've done your snapshot analysis and look through the various reports of what's going on. This recording, and there's several others, you can see they're moving the mouse around. They're interested in the content here of uh, this product. And you'll see as they continue to move, and I'm just going to speed it up slightly, um, they'll scroll down, they'll look more, they'll make a few additional clicks. But as this recording plays out, one thing I would uh, recommend is look for more recordings to see if there's more behaviors like this. This is a recording that's showing they've caught the interest of the 25% off. It seems like they might be considering signing up, but they're really interested more in the products and they'll scroll back up, but yet they don't seem to be able to get at the information they want. So I definitely would look for more recordings that are showing this type of behavior. See if there is, um, it's the same pages that people are struggling with, and then go back and review uh, your snapshots and the people that are clicking on those elements, look at your segments to see what's going on. Is there something that you could change or perhaps make clearer? Is there perhaps some questions that you could end up asking uh, customers on to get more of an idea of why is um, this page causing hesitation? Keep in mind this is uh, one of several recordings. So just let that play out. And uh, Juliana, I'd pass it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, JL. This has been insanely educational. Thank you both for sharing your insights with us. 
Uh, we wanted to leave plenty of time for Q&A. I haven't seen too many questions in the chat. So if anyone out there has a question, now this is the time to ask us. And please don't be shy. John and JL are both delightful humans. Looks like there's one from Karen, how to find the heat map. So the heat map uh, report, I'll just go back one. When you have at least one visitor um, on your snapshot and it becomes underlined, you can just click on that name of your snapshot and it's the very first report that you will see. And then you'll have, um, your four other reports that you can click through. Yeah, I'll address the question around uh, why are people following infinite scroll on many websites? It's a great question. And I think, you know, the idea here is that a lot of brands are just blindly copying what everyone else is doing and they think is the latest trend. And I've seen, I think this is how pop-up email pop-ups actually started a number of years back is a couple of larger brands started doing it to test it out. And a lot of other brands thought, well, it must be working for them. So I'll do it as well. And the reality here is again, as I mentioned at the start of, of the webinar, that really don't want to blindly copy what competition is doing or, or what you see out on the internet. Now, Infinite Scroll is great for helping with SEO, perhaps, because you're only loading what you need. It slows down or it speeds up your site speed. But in the end, it's just not a great consumer experience. And I think one of the great things that you can see with that in Crazy Egg is that scroll map, like Joe, JL showed earlier. You can quickly see how people are dropping off in Infinite Scroll. So I would highly recommend um, not doing infinite scroll, we don't see that it performs very well at all. Jail, it looks like you have a couple questions in chat. Uh, Chris wants to know, would drop down menu items be on the list view? Yes, so we capture everything that happens on the page. Anything that's not visually or visible on the page of your visual report will be captured under the not visible uh, tab. And then one other thing I'd point out with the both tab, when you're analyzing, it's a really good idea to look at them combined because if you are finding a lot of stuff that is under not visible is high in your list, then you can, uh, it, it can be an indication of why people are, sorry, why you would have like a high bounce rate or an exit rate on your page. Awesome. And then Rosa says, do the reports allow for numerical breakouts, for example, in the scroll map? So in the scroll map, no. Um, but in the confetti report, you can get a numerical breakout. So we show the top 14. And you can further segment if you're interested in like particular, uh, in this case, referral sources to see what their pattern is. And then you have all of those options. So when you export it, you'll get a numerical. Overlay is also, I'll just go to the desktop for this one. Overlay is also numerical. And again, you can get by clicking on the more plus this, uh, what I refer to as the baby confetti report to find out more details. Awesome, does anyone else have a question? I always like to try to stump JL. She pretty much knows everything. <laughs> oh, it looks like, uh, are there any other things like pop-ups that people shouldn't be doing? That sounds like a John question to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, I think that the first thing that brands need to be doing is collecting this information right? And understanding what's not working on their individual site. Look, there are hundreds of user interactions and, and user experience concerns that I could tell you are just best practices and that you shouldn't be doing it on your site in the vein of, you know, email pop-ups and rotating carousel images and things of that sort. But really it should start with the 
actual clicks and movements of your specific site's visitors. And that's really where Crazy Egg comes in and, and helps you understand that data. Looking at that data and using that to understand what should be optimized on your site is really going to be the key here. And not just understanding a list of best practices and applying it. As I mentioned before, you know, the two items I called out today, you could clearly see were challenges based on, on the data we looked at today. Love it. Uh, Rosa says, when creating the snapshots, is there an average for the delay timer section? Okay, so as far as um, creating the snapshot, you actually, so how do I say this? 98% of the time, you'll never touch delay timer. You'll leave it as a default setting and all delay timer is is when our server goes out to take that static image of the page that you want to track, our system will wait 20 seconds after your page fully loads in order to do that. And usually that's all the length of time that's required. In very rare cases, um, support will advise you to delay the timer further just because your page is taking a little bit longer to load than again, the industry average. So rule of thumb, typically delay it by an additional 60 seconds, just so our system can grab that static image and then be on the way. This has absolutely nothing to do with visitor tracking. It will not affect your visitors coming to your page and delay uh, the page loading for them at all. Awesome, looks like we've got a whole bunch more questions. So can we see what amount of time is being spent by the users on certain parts of the screen, kind of an attention map? Yeah, so if we go to the confetti and we do, so we have a time of day, so it's not exactly what you're asking, but we do have a time of day of like, when are people coming? So the most popular time uh, for mobile visitors to the homepage is from, and, and sorry, right now this is showing, um, I'm in the Eastern time zone, so this is showing Eastern time zone. When you open it up, it shows within your time zone. Um, so it's showing 9.30 to 10 o'clock at night is the most popular time for mobile visitors to be coming to the homepage here, and then shows you where they're making those uh, clicks. And then time to click is what I was uh, referring to. So if I go to the overlay, and let me just put it on both to get at that ax. It's, it's dark on this particular one, but there is a more plus here. And I will move it to time to click. And this is what I was referring to. 28% of the visitors are taking four to five seconds uh, to before they'll click on that X. And that's because there's a slight delay, it's about three seconds before it pops up. So those are the two opportunities for time. We had a question about GDPR as it relates to recordings. Do you wanna show really quickly how you can mask uh, visitor information? Because we definitely have those capabilities. Yeah, so Crazy Egg is uh, GDPR compliant. And as far as um, privacy concerns, you do have the opportunity to mask an entire page in the recordings. We do not record IP addresses. Um, like Juliana said, she's uh, based out of uh, Toronto, Canada right now. Um, you would not be able to see in a recording that someone from Toronto, Canada came or from uh, Portland, Oregon came. What you would see is that someone from Canada came or someone from uh, the US had come. So again, you can mask an entire page. We automatically, in compliance to GDPR and other privacy legislation across the globe, mask any elements that are named in this convention, or you can create your own mask. So if we type in, and I'll just use a different site as a example here. If you type in the page URL, then the page will pull up. You can simply click on the element and that will mask uh, the element. So if you saved it, 
it will show up in this list. And if you want to remove that mask, you could click there. Further to that is if you did have anyone that um, their information was captured and they, they come to you and say, please remove anything. You can type in their name, their email address, their phone number, whatever uh, might have identified them on your website that might have been recorded under one of these uh, session recordings. Do a search. It will email you that information. And then what will happen is it will give you a report like this where you can simply do a bulk uh, check and delete the recordings. Awesome. You have, I'll just throw out there, if you have any concerns with security privacy, please email in um, and we can help you or meet with your security officers for all of that. And that email is help at crazyegg.com if anyone wants to learn more about GDPR or anything else really. Um, we're always open to sharing information. Uh, you guys are amazing. The questions are just flowing in the chat box. Uh, so I think we have one about the list report, if there were several pop-ups on homepage, but not anymore, will X's on the list report or not visible clarify which one? Yeah, so our list report, the way I normally teach about it is it's our most technical report. And it all depends how uh, your web programmers or the platform you're using has designed it. So in most cases, yes, it will be uniquely identified and you'll be able to know that um, this X was associated with um, the first pop-up, the next X was associated with uh, the second pop-up. Um, if you find that it's not, um, then by all means, I'd go back to your web developers and get their assistance or reach out to support and we'll help you with your web developers to uh, code it so it's uniquely identified. Awesome. Uh, let's see, we've got a question. What happens when the banner doesn't visualize the clicks in overlay report? I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure if I understand what that means either, but give me one second. Um, I don't know if this one has a banner or not. It does not. So in the overlay report with a banner, um, in particular if it's a carousel, you're going to look for those clicks on, um, sorry, I'm still looking for that one. I'm going to see if it's this one. It, like So the overlay here where you have the clicks to continue on. You can click there and find out more details about how many clicks are happening and where. And then in combination with the list report, because each picture would have been named uniquely, you can find out which picture is actually getting the one that has the most interaction. As well as, um, again, with the pop-up overlay, um, you can't get at it, but if the pop-up was omitted from the creation of the snapshot, you could get down at the radio buttons here and see the same uh, type information. Love it. Uh, Sarah says, can we check where the visitors are located? I mean, can we check the region or country who are visiting the site? That is definitely a yes. Yeah, so let me, let me go this way. Um, and I will just go to country. So I am going to choose Australia. Um, so you can segment out, you can see all of them, or you could just see one of the top 14 and see where they're clicking. And it's the same thing with the overlay. So you can go to country and see that information. You can also, if I remove this filter, under filter, you can also specify a country uh, and, and filter for your recordings on that country as well. I love this next question. Uh, is it possible to configure any surveys if we can have a small form displayed to the users and if the questions to be asked can be configured from Crazy Egg? We actually are just launching a new integration with SurveyMonkey. Yeah, so I, I'm as excited as Juliana and everyone else here at Crazy Egg. So I would say, um, Juliana, we need to 
get that person's email and uh, we will be sending you out an email along with others uh, when we're launching it which should be within the next uh, quarter is my understanding but stay tuned we will have that feature uh, definitely this calendar year. Oh yeah, and then if our biz dev lead has his way, probably the next week or two. <laughs> <laughs> We're all very excited about it. Uh, all right, Rosa says, is there a page where we can see exactly how you guys define all the metrics? It looks like Cecilia added a link to our glossary page, which is perfect. Uh, regarding time delay, why would we want to wait 31 seconds for a page to load and then Crazy Egg start taking snapshots? So I, I will address that question. There's, um, it, it doesn't work that way. When you're creating a snapshot, we're not continuously creating snapshot over snapshot over snapshot um, for a page. We create a single snapshot of that page. So let me just go back to here. You create a snapshot, you specify the page, and at the time that you're creating the snapshot, when you get through our process and you click next, it tells our server to go out and take a static image of the web page as it stands right now. And this will tie into another question um, later on that's been asked. Um, when that happens, that sets, us, sets the system up to give you a visual report so you you can see what your page looks like based on the device type you said to take it from then what is happening is our system monitors for visitors clicks and scrolls so that's what's being updated we're not continuously going out and grabbing a new static image of your page um, and doing any type of uh, time delays so it's a, it's a one-time thing. When people visit and your page opens up in a browser, we're, get, we're grabbing that information. So why I said this kind of goes into another one. I think the question was asked by David about archiving and refreshing snapshots. Um, the rule of thumb or best practice, if you've made a change to your web page that is a significant change, so a significant change would be um, changing up a banner or changing the location of uh, the 60 day money back and adding a new picture into here. Best practice says from an analysis point of view, stop the snapshot and create a brand new one. That way you can use our compare feature. And I'm going to choose um, a page somewhat at random here where when you make those changes you can now compare side by side to see did that change have a positive effect or did it have a negative effect or no effect at all in the behavior of your visitors across all the various reports so as far as archiving uh, snapshots um, Again, the rule of thumb is with your subscription, you're allowed so many snapshot creations. So once you have snapshots that are completed that are really like 2014 into 2019, I would probably come along here and do an export on these snapshots so that you still have the reports, but I would delete them. Looks like we, I think there might be some confusion around the time delay uh, topic because uh, David, another David said, what if customer moves off the page before 20 seconds? So I guess the question is maybe like, why is the default 20 seconds there? Like what if people don't spend that much time on the page? Again, the time delay has absolutely nothing to do with the tracking of visitors or how long they're spending on your page. It has everything to do with just grabbing that static image of your web page. Okay, I hope that helped. David, if you have additional questions about it, definitely uh, shoot a note to help at crazy.com. We can maybe give you an illustration or a use case. 
Ooh, Rosa's asking a question I love as the head of marketing. Are there any case studies of how other clients have used Crazy Egg that you guys can share? Uh, I mean, personally, yes, uh, we have a case study page. Um, if you go to crazyegg.com slash case studies, I think there's a dash between case and studies. Um, but JL also does a lot of zero sessions with our customers, so she could probably share a couple stories off the cuff as well. Um, thank you, Juliana. <laughs> so, yes, there's, I've just pulled up the page for uh, the case studies. And I will have to admit, Juliana has stumped me. Um, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you succeeded. There, by all means, email us, email us in. Um, we have a number of case studies underway, and uh, there's a number of uh, stories that we can share on behalf of uh, customers that we've helped. Uh, the one that's coming to my mind is actually around recordings. If you happen to have, say, a video that plays on your website, um, our recordings will show you if there's trouble with that video or if there's trouble with something on your website. You can't always test for every scenario to make sure that your website pulls up under every device type, which is why we give you the details of what device type, the screen resolution, the operating system, um, sorry, the operating system over here and the browser type. Uh, one customer in particular, we managed to help them uh, greatly increase their sales because they had a problem with their video and that's what the recordings were showing. Yeah, and we have like a ton of range of customers that are in e-commerce or they're in finance or, you know, they are a journalism site and they're trying to get more engagement on their content versus, you know, um, customers who are trying to make direct sales and they just want to convert um, at a higher rate and make the most of the customers they're already getting through traffic. So there's a lot of different use cases and we found, you know, even agencies like The Good are using us to optimize the sites of their clients. So uh, it's a really flexible uh, platform that really does a lot um, to surface insights that you might find valuable. And, you know, what you find valuable is usually pretty personal to the company, but that we definitely see trends in those types of segments seeing value. Um, so yeah, always happy to chat more about case studies. <laughs> um, in the interest of time, since we're going to hit the one hour mark soon, I want to let us wrap up and have everyone get back to their days. So, um, oh, there's a pricing page question. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> we'll talk about pricing for a second. How do we know how many snapshots will come with that tier package? All of our snapshots come with a um, hundred snapshots or sorry, all of our snapshots, all of our plans, subscriptions come with a uh, hundred snapshots. Um, if you do find that you're uh, going over a hundred, we can um, look at increasing, creating a custom plan for you or give you some best practice tips to um, archive uh, your snapshots and go from there. Perfect. Uh, yeah, and we'll be sending out an email after this with a recording and extra information if you guys are interested. So um, as I mentioned, I think a couple times, um, help at crazyegg.com is a really great way to reach us with your questions as well. Uh, okay, so let's wrap this up. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us and asking a million questions. It always warms my heart as the webinar moderator to see people engage. So I really appreciate it. Um, thanks again to David Link for volunteering, Tommy Copper's website. Uh, love a quick show of hands in the chat. Uh, yes or no, would you like us to do another one of these teardowns in the future? Do you think you would find that valuable? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, okay. Yes, of course, awesome. All right, yeah, I mean, this has been one of, one of our more popular webinars, 100 yeses, awesome, Mary. Okay, great, we will definitely do this maybe on a monthly basis. And for all the people that we didn't accept the nomination because we picked Tommy Copper, uh, you are still in the running, so if you submitted your website, I will be reviewing the list and picking another winner. <laughs> Maggie Island, awesome. Thank you, Sean. Uh, all right, so I would love to say thank you as well to uh, John from The Good for, for hosting with us. Uh, I think his heat map analysis was amazing. I learned a lot just from listening to him talk, so we really appreciate your being here, John. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here as well. Yeah, so uh, you guys should be getting an email from us in the next day or two with follow-up. And in the meantime, if you want to check out crazyag.com and thegood.com, feel free to do so. And have a great day, everyone. <laughs>